Hello, HSC 110, Medical Terminology and Body Systems. This is Dr. Teresa. In this video, we're going to continue with Chapter 6 on the muscular system. We're going to start right in around slide 26 or 27. And in your book, okay, these next two slides here, <clears throat> You can read, I'm not going to um, record a lecture on these specific little side note boxes, but they're interesting. So you can learn a little bit of um, how the sports world works and, and even if we're not really into, you know, competitive methods, um, the strength training portion you can read through that too and that's on page 180 so these these two slides i'm beginning with once page 179 and 180 in your textbook um just for some awareness um i am in favor of strength training being the primary exercise that you incorporate into a health regimen by the way not for you know bodybuilding competition kind of things. But when we talk about muscle tissue within human physiology, it has a vastly different metabolism than other types of tissues and can actually enhance your health just by its existence. It also, as we know, will deliver us strength. This is overall strength, but also of joints. So if we start doing some nice routines of strength training, maybe within our 20s and 30s, or building a foundation that can be perpetuated into our later years as well. So I, I do support strength training more heavily than I support cardio exercise, although both are important and relevant to get in there somehow. Okay, so as we're talking about skeletal muscles, we have to recognize directional what's called directional motions, okay? Now, recall that muscles, skeletal muscles particularly, are attaching to either an aponeurosis or a bone. This happens so that we can move bones, like our lever system. So in <clears throat> skeletal muscles, we have an attachment point called the origin and an attachment point set of points called the insertion. The end of the muscle that attaches to a relatively fixed structure is called the origin, and the end of the muscle that will attach to the bone or whatever, this is called the insertion. <clears throat> we need to understand, that I think this is a powerful concept to understand remember and reflect on because when even when we're evaluating the body for what could be wrong we have to look at both ends of a muscle where it attaches and what it could in that impact if it's not functioning properly and if a muscle is not functioning properly neither will the joints bones or structures that it's supporting or attached to When stimulated to develop tension, remember that muscles can only pull. They don't push. Okay, what that you can push, but a muscle contracts and pulls something up, right? Or it will relax and extend and then like open things up. For this section, we have to remember that there are three major planes in the body, the sagittal planes, meaning that the body gets, for whatever you're looking at, gets divided into right and left sides. The frontal plane gets the body, or whatever you're looking at, divided into an anterior, posterior portion, or ventral, dorsal, front, or back. A transverse section um, separates the body, or whatever you're looking at, into an inferior portion, inferior or caudal, and then, I'm sorry, inferior, um, yeah, 
<laughs> inferior or superior, uh, inferior or caudal, <clears throat> opposed to superior or cranial. So you could, we can have motion of bones through these planes to describe a particular type of movements. We can have forward and backward motions. This can take place within the sagittal plane. If you kind of look back in your chapter one and look how the body is sliced, the movement will occur in the direction of the plane. A sideways motion then will occur within the directionality of the frontal plane. And then anything that rotates occurs in the transverse plane. Examples of sagittal plane movement. Okay, when we're talking the foot, there's something called plantar flexion and dorsiflexion. So the bottom of your foot is the plantar surface. The top of your foot is the dorsal surface. So if we are flexing something, we are decreasing its angle between two bones. Well, more than two bones in this case, but two regions of the body, okay? <clears throat> when we're dorsiflexing, we're pulling the top of the foot closer to your shin. When you plant our fat flex, you're pointing your toe. So when we're describing a motion, we have to give it like its reference point, right? Where do we, where do we start? And then from the starting point, which is generally anatomical position, um, how is the motion occurring and what part is involved? So flexion will describe a forward bending motion of the head, trunk, upper arm, forearm, hand, and hip. But it also includes backward motion of the lower leg at the knee. In flexion movements, the body surfaces <clears throat> are coming together. Extension returns a body segment from a position of flexion back to anatomical position. Hyperextension will go beyond that. So in, our, in this first um, examination of movements within the sagittal plane, again, the foot has its own words, dorsiflexion, plantar flexion. But when we're looking at the shoulder in the next example, we can see from anatomical position, flexion of the shoulder is bringing that shoulder up kind of by our ear or, or we're swinging the arm up by the ear. When it's in extension, it's coming out of flexion and back to neutral. A hyperextensive uh, activity would be starting at neutral or anatomical position. And in this case, we're talking the shoulder, it's being extended, or the arm is being extended at the shoulder. So we're taking it backwards behind the body. But we're talking frontal plane motions. We have two motions called abduction and adduction. Abduction brings a body part away from the midline of the body. And usually we say it just like I said it, AB as in boy, abduction, to differentiate when someone says adduction, ADD. Okay, adduction adds the body part to the body. Will decrease the angle, okay, at the joint that's doing the swinging. When we're talking specifically about the feet, they can do something called inversion and eversion. Eversion, our, our point of reference is that plantar surface, okay? Where are we putting it? The bottom of the foot. We're trying an inversion to swing the bottom of our foot and point it outward. That's eversion. When we invert, we're bringing 
that plantar surface of the foot or the bottom of the foot, trying to turn it so it faces midline. <clears throat> In the hand, we can take something through what's called radial deviation or ulnar deviation. Radial deviation will deviate that hand toward the radius of the arm. Ulnar deviation takes it towards the other, uh, towards your pinky. When we're talking transverse planes of movement, this is going to deal with rotation movements. Lateral rotation. We will take something from anatomical position and spin it within that transverse plane, pointing or facing outward. When we have a medial rotation, the opposite is true. We take it at anatomical position and rotate something inward. <clears throat> there are movements also referred to as pronation and supination within this plane. So if you pronate the hand, you're from anatomical position, which, you, which the hands start palms facing forward. If you pronate them from that position, you take the palms and you spin them all the way backwards. That would be pronation. Supination then would be coming out of that pronated position. And the one way you can remember this maybe is that when you supinate, you might be able to hold soup in your hands. Okay, make a little cup in your hands. You may have also heard the positions prone or supine. They, that is related to these two terms. If we are in prone position, that's belly down. If we are in supine position, that's when we're laying on our back, facing the ceiling. And again, you can, could apply it to a particular body part. When we have a multi-plane type of movement, an example of this is circumduction, something that we can spin in a circle. So this is an example of doing it with a finger, but also you can do this really easily with ball and socket joints of your shoulders and hips. <clears throat> okay, now let's review some of the muscle names. You will have to know some of these names for your second quiz. Again, I posted a review of that already for you. There's a nice chart in your textbook on page 185. So I feel like we should kind of, we're gonna use that to look at. We'll use this picture and then we'll go through some of the functions of each muscle. Okay, so we're gonna identify first of all, some of the names um, of this in a minute. And we can kind of go through what they do. When we're talking head and neck, we can divide the muscles of the head and neck into a couple groups, facial muscles, chewing muscles, and neck muscles. The difference between facial muscles and most other muscles is that the insertion of the facial muscle will connect them to other muscles or skin rather than a bone. So when the muscle contracts, it's pulling skin. This delivers us the ability to have facial expression. With the exception of the orbicularis oris, which encircles the mouth, and the sheet-like platysma, which is like your under your chin, your neck, your throat. All of the head and neck muscles are paired besides those two. So, so when we when we're referring to anything that's paired, it's going to have like a it has a partner, right? It has a right and a left side. And we we saw that didn't get into it heavily in the skeletal chapter, but we saw it okay from side to side in the body. So the frontalis muscle covers the frontal bone of the skull, and you will notice that if we have a bone name. Likely, we're going to have a similar muscular name. So one system supports 
the understanding of the other. This will attach the epicranial aponeurosis, which in this picture you get a nice view. It's like that connective tissue sheet that we discussed that we have um, throughout our body. To the skin above the eyebrows, which will enable the eyebrows <clears throat> and wrinkling of the forehead. Uh, I'm sorry, elevation of the eyebrows and wrinkling of the forehead. On the posterior side, the epicranial aponeurosis is attached to the temporal bone by the occipitalis muscle. That's the base of your skull. If you can guess what bones underneath there, that would be good. I will tell you it's the occipital bone. Contraction of the occipitalis will pull the scalp posteriorly. The orbicularis oculi. Hopefully, just by the nomenclature, you're able to understand the, the wordology here, okay? The orbicularis should uh, tell you that there's a circle. Oculi tells us something with eyes. Ocular, oculi. The orbicularis oris, again, it's a musk, it's a circular muscle. Oris tells us we're talking about the oral cavity. <clears throat> the orbicularis oculi will deliver us the ability to squint, close our eyes. The orbicularis oris can close the mouth and extend the lips. When we look at the bucinator muscle and the zygomaticus, the bucinator will extend from the maxilla and mandible to the orbicularis oris. When it contracts, it will compress the cheek. The zygomaticus is named for its origin on the zygomatic bone, but it will attach to the skin and muscle around the corners of the mouth. So this guy will help us smile. The major muscles that we use for chewing will be the masseter, which connects to the zygomatic process of the temporal bone, to the mandible or jawbone. The contraction of the masseter will elevate the mandible and bring the teeth together. The temporalis is another muscle that's involved in chewing. The temporalis, hopefully by the name, you can tell that it's gonna be associated with and or cover or attached to the temporal bone of the skull. Then we have what's called the bucinator, which we mentioned. It assists in chewing as well. So chewing muscles, masseter, temporalis, and bucinator primarily. The muscles of our neck um, will include a muscle called the sternocleidomastoid or what we abbreviate as the SCM. And they will help move the head. When they contract together, the sternocleidomastoid muscles will produce 
flexion of the head and neck. When one contracts alone, it will rotate the head and neck. The platysma muscle, this is a single thin, flat, super muscle, superficial muscle that will layer that whole throat neck area. It originates in the connective tissue that covers the chest muscles and inserts in the tissues around the mouth. So the contraction of this will pour the corners of the mouth down. It's also activated when we open our mouth really wide. Now, when we look at the muscles of the trunk, we're gonna start by looking at the anterior trunk muscles. Primarily, trunk muscles provide stability for the spine. They're responsible for helping with posture then. But also the muscles of the trunk help us with our thoracic pump, our respiratory pump, and the increasing of interthecal pressure, as well as doing lots of body movements. So it will allow flexion, extension, hyperextension, lateral flexion, and rotation of the head and trunk. <clears throat> Along with all the other things that I just mentioned. It also serves as a protective sheath for the organs of the thoracic and abdominal cavities. The muscles of the trunk, you have a chart also on page 186 that I would look at, very nicely laid out. I'm gonna walk through some of it. So we have on the anterior portion, first of all, you can see the, the aponeurosis right in the center, okay? Kind of running along that. We have the rectus abdominis muscle. You can see evidence here of an external oblique. When that gets retracted, cut away and retracted, we can see our internal oblique muscles. And we've likely heard these terms if you've ever done an abdominal workout. Now, we also have muscles in and around our ribs, which are really obviously important. We have intercostal muscles, internal ones, and external intercostal muscles. The internal ones will be more internal on the interior portion of the rib cage. And they're going to help with breathing as well as creating that thoracic and respiratory pump. So the rectus abdominis is a paired muscle. It's flat and it's encased in the uh, a sheath called the rectus sheath. The muscles are separated by the band of connective tissue called the linea alba. This is in combination with several lateral bands of connective tissue that divide the muscle into eight muscle bellies, which is what delivers a six pack appearance if someone works that muscle group. <clears throat> the rectus abdominis will connect the pubic crest to the sternum and will run uh, and connect to ribs five through seven. With the contraction of this, we can flex the trunk. Or if it contracts on one side, we get a lateral flexion. The external oblique muscles, these are paired muscles. 
and they are superficial in the abdominal region. They form the lateral walls of the abdomen, contributing to trunk flexion as well. On the innermost portion, we have the internal obliques connecting to the iliac crest and ribs 10 through 12. These muscles are positioned at right angles to the external obliques. Then we have the external and internal intercostal muscles where the contraction of the external internal muscles will pull the ribs outward as we inhale and contraction of the internals will pull the ribs inward which will compress the lungs and so we can exhale the air. The diaphragm is a dome-shaped sheet of muscle and fibrous tissue that will separate the thoracic and abdominal cavities. Contraction of the diaphragm will enlarge the thoracic cavity, which will help draw or suck air into the lungs. When we are looking at the posterior trunk, oh, one thing I have to point out, okay, when this is a great place to do it. We do have what we call superficial and deep muscles, and there's an intermediate layer as well. So you, as we go through it, we'll be looking at a particular layer, and then we dig in a little bit deeper and we can see a deeper layer of musculature. On this case is no different. So in the posterior superficial muscle groups of our back, we have the trapezius muscle, which is paired. This guy is big and actually you could separate it into different parts of itself, but it's going to look like a giant kite on our back. So it will run from the occipital bone of the skull down what's called the nuchal ligament and attach to the spinous processes of vertebras C7 through T3. The insertion point is on the clavicle and the scapular spine. If you body build, this is the big giant shoulder muscles. On that first picture, we get to see the, well, actually better view of the deeper muscles. We get to see the erector spinae group. This will include three columns of muscle running most of the length of the spine, and they include the iliocostalis, longismus, and spinalis muscles. The iliocostalis muscle will originate on the ilium and ribs, and it will connect to the adjacent ribs and transverse processes. The longissimus will connect the transverse processes of adjacent vertebra. The spinalis will connect adjacent spinous processes of the vertebra. These, this muscle group that we're looking at here, these will help extend the trunk, also help with posture holding. There's also a muscle in the lower part of your spine called the quadratus lumborum. This will help extend the trunk. It originates on the iliac crest, inserts on the upper lumbar vertebra and they have a similar function as the erector spinae group. Now that quadratus lumborum is super relevant when someone has low back pain, by the way. <clears throat> and the others are relevant as well. But that one you can feel very easily. It's contraction. Now, when we talk muscles of the upper limb, 
we're looking at the shoulder, the elbow, the wrist, and the fingers. So for the upper part of the body, again, there's another very nice graph. Familiar yourself, familiarize yourself with that um, as you prepare for your quiz and you need to understand, you know, some of the muscles, names, what they do, where they're at kind of thinking. Uh, page 189 is the chart for the upper limb. When we're looking at the <clears throat> anterior view, we see the deltoid muscle, pectoralis, brachy, biceps brachii, the brachialis, and the brachioradialis. When we look at muscles from the posterior view. We see the triceps. It's, you understand that it's named that because when we're looking at the shape of that muscle, its origins, insertions, and actions, we're recognizing that it has three heads to it, okay? Whereas the biceps brachii has two heads. It comes together in the mus same muscle belly, okay, or attachment point. We went over that in the first video as far as shape of muscle, and that might help you understand why there might be a name like this. We also noticed something called the latissimus dorsi. The latissimus dorsi will originate on the lower sixth thoracic and lumbar vertebra. Ribs 10 through 12, the sacrum and the iliac crest, and it will insert on the anterior portion of the humerus. So remember, the insertion point is what need, will we be moved. So when we have a muscle like this kind of crossing over body parts, understanding that its primary role is going to be to do something with the arm. Let's look at the next section of muscles acting on the shoulder. Remember that the shoulder is a ball and socket joint. When we have a ball and socket joint, its range of motion is big and broad. It can move in many planes, do many things. Highest range of motion but also they're the most complex joints and they get injured very easily. So when we're looking at the parts that impact the actual movement of the shoulder, we identify the pectoralis major, the latissimus dorsi and that deltoid muscle. Four muscles attaching to the humerus and the scapula contribute to the stability of this joint. And the connections, okay, so tendons as well as muscles will create what we call the rotator cuff. The rotator cuff also includes what's called the sit muscles. Sit stands for certain muscle names and they have a certain um, direction of motion that they help the shoulder perform. The sit muscles include the supraspinatus, the infraspinatus, the teres minor and something called the subscapularis. Now by the names, hopefully they would help you be able to locate where they are anatomically. 
the supraspinata, supra above the spine of the scapula. Infraspinatus is below the spine of the scapula. There's a teres minor, there's also a teres major muscle, but that's not included in this particular grouping that's known as the rotator cuff. And then we have the subscapularis, which is on the, actually the anterior side of the scapula is where it's located. The supraspinatus is named again after its origin in the supraspinous fossa of the scapula and will help the arm with abduction. The infraspinatus has its origin in the infraspinous fossa and contributes to the lateral rotation of the humerus. The teres minor originates <clears throat> on the lateral posterior portion of the scapula, also laterally rotates the humerus. And then the subscapularis is attached to the subscapular fossa and helps medially rotate the humerus. Now, when we talk about muscles that are involved in moving and activating the joints at the elbow and the wrist, the muscles involved here will be the biceps brachii, triceps brachii, brachialis, and brachioradialis, like I've already mentioned. <clears throat> so the biceps and triceps brachii are superficial muscles on the anterior and posterior, respectively, aspects of the arm. One head of the biceps originates on the superior side of the glenoid fossa. The glenoid fossa is that articulation point between the humeral head and the scapula. And the other will originate on the coracoid process of the scapula. They, both heads of this muscle then will insert on the radial tuberosity enabling the biceps with supination and flexion of the or forearm. The heads of the triceps will cover the posterior part of the arm with its origins on the inferior glenoid fossa and the entire humeral shaft. It will insert on the olecranon, if you remember that name, we have an olecranon fossa in process. The triceps will contract to extend the arm at the elbow. The brachialis and brachioradialis. These will contribute to flexion of the forearm. The brachialis will connect the humerus and ulna, and the brachioradialis connects the radius and humerus. There are nine muscles that cross the wrist and 10 muscles contained entirely within the hand, many of which branch to several of the fingers. The names of many of these muscles will describe their functions as well as their location. For example, the flexor carpi ulnaris will cause flexion at the wrist and crosses the wrist on the ulna or the little finger side of your body. When we look at the lower limb, there's a nice chart on page 192 where we can talk through some of the uh, functions of the musculature of the lower limb. So we have the gluteus maximus originating on the sacrum in the ilium. It will insert on the gluteal tuberosity of the femur. Its function is to extend and laterally rotate the leg. Then we have a glute gluteus medius, 
that originates on the posterior ilium, inserts on the greater trochanter of the femur, and it functions to abduct and medially rotate the leg. The iliopsoas, which is the fusion of the iliacus and the psoas muscle. This guy's really important also in low back pain. It serves to help flex the leg at the hip. The adductor muscles include the magnus, the longus, and the brevis. The adductor muscle group will adduct and medially rotate the leg. The soratorius, one of the neatest muscles ever, I think so. It originates on the anterior superior iliac spine, so it attaches or originates on the ilium and inserts on the proximal tibia below the knee. So, so it crosses hip to medial knee. It helps with flexion and lateral rotation of the leg. And as you can see on this picture, which I, uh, again, encourage you to get a handle on some of the nomenclature here. Sartorius is like one of the coolest muscles. It, this is the hip bone is connected to the knee bone kind of thinking. Okay, I'm not gonna read through the rest. I'll read through the names of the rest of these. Um, I wouldn't get too wound up on origin insertion, okay? I would um, have just have an idea of what it helps your body do. Um, and, and then, you know, as you're preparing for the quiz, um, I don't think it goes that in depth on, on that stuff here, but for awareness, again, the major thing you need to understand with all of this is has an origin. It has some type of insertion. It moves the insertion in a particular plane of motion or plane direction of motion. So in this, we see within the quadricep muscle group, quadricep tells us that we have four muscles. The quadricep is our upper thigh, front upper thigh. So within this group, we have the rectus femoris, the vastus lateralis, intermedius, and medialis. Hopefully the names give you an indicator of where they're located, but let's look. Right here, the quadricep muscle group is shown to us. The rectus femoris is the big bellied muscle right in the center of our thigh. The vastus lateralis will be the most lateral muscle. The vastus medialis will be the most medial muscle. And the intermedius is going to be a little tough to see. Uh, and I don't think it's able to be shown on this particular picture. We have to retract some muscles. When we get to the hamstring, the hamstring is the back of your leg, the back of your thigh. Within this grouping, we have a semi-tendinosus, semi-membranosus, and the biceps femoris. The biceps femoris of the hamstrings is the most lateral muscle. This guy <clears throat> originates on your ischial tuberosity. Your ischial tuberosity, again, that's your, your butt bone or your buttock bone. The short head of it will originate on the linear aspera. The insertion point of this muscle is lateral condyle of the tibia and the head of the fibula. This muscle will serve to, well, all of the hamstring muscles, will serve to flex the leg at the knee and laterally rotate. When we get to the muscles of the calf, the calf's kind of neat to me, okay? When we look at it from the 
Well, you can see it from either direction. It's more easily seen from the posterior view is the gastrocnemius. That's the biggest part of your calf, calf muscle. Okay. And if someone's a bodybuilder and you can really see their calf muscle definition, you're likely looking at their gastrocnemius. And it really, one of its primary functions is to plantar flex that foot and flex the leg at the knee. We then have the other major muscle of the calf called the soleus. It's going to connect the fib and tib to the calcaneus by way of the Achilles tendon. We know what the Achilles tendon is. We see it's a ginormous band of connective tissue going from the gastrocnemius to the calcaneus. Again, the soleus, its role is to plantar flex the foot. But if you look at it, you can see the soleus from both directions, but the soleus is more easily seen on the anterior view, medially. We can also see from the anterior view, the tibialis anterior muscle, which is gonna be lateral to the tibia from this view. And this muscle here is the reason you get a shin splint primarily. It's responsible for dorsiflexion and inversion of the foot. Then we have something called an extensor digitorum longus. Then there's something called the fibularis longus, fibularis brevis, and fibularis tertius. All three of these fibulari muscles will originate on the fibula, insert on the metatarsals, and they have the role and goal to plantar flex and evert. <laughs>